the future generation is facing a choice that has never arisen in human history. This generation, like it or not, has to decide whether organized human society is going to survive. Welcome to Standing Up. And we're live. Oh, wait. That's the other show. We're not live. What's up, everyone? Pre-recorded. Noam Chomsky. This was a big one. I would suggest you don't skip through this little intro because it's going to give some insight as to how I conducted the interview. First, it goes without saying that this is the biggest interview I've ever done, and it was a great honor. I have admired Noam for many years. Not that I agree with all his positions, but I have admired his deep, deep wealth of knowledge and his commitment to activism for decades, decades before I was born and even before my parents were born. Getting to speak to him is something I never thought I would be able to do, so it was a great honor. Going into this, I knew I only had 30 minutes of time with him, so it put me in a situation where I either can push back on areas of our disagreement or I just move on to the next question. I decided to move on to the next question because I did want to get his opinion on as much as possible in the short time we had together. There was, er there was one area where I strongly disagree with the response he gave. Um, and I think it's worth clarifying a little bit because maybe I didn't even present the question the right way and I'm, I'm open to that. I'm interested in hearing what you think. Noam Chomsky coined a term, manufactured consent. He wrote a book about it. There's a documentary as well. The concept of manufactured consent is that the media manufactures the consent of the people to the will of the, of the government and the corporate establishment. And he demonstrates how this exists, how this happens, especially when it comes to convincing Americans that it's justified to invade another country. What I tried showing Noam was that there's a growing denialism in the United States and many other countries around the world in the form of uh, anti-vaxxers, anti-climate change, anti-corona. They, they think these things are a hoax that are being pushed on us by the government, the media, and the corporate establishment. They view it as a form of manufactured consent. And it seems like to get to the bottom of any of these conspiracies, it takes an immense amount of research, and there's just so much information and misinformation out there that it's very hard to know what's true and what's not. I was not pleased with his answer, but again, maybe he did not understand my question as I was presenting it. Again, I'm... I'm interested in hearing what you think. Furthermore, we did not speak about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I know many viewers would have liked to see that conversation. The reason I didn't ask him about that was A, because we just did not have much time, and B, because his position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been quite clear for many decades. So I prefer to ask him about topics that his position is not clear. In addition to that, I decided to leave the entire episode live. Generally, I take out a little bit and put it on Patreon for Patreon supporters. But because I only had 30 minutes with him and I feel what he said is valuable, I wanted to share it all with everybody. That being said, if you do like this content, support me on Patreon so we can make more awesome content. You'll see a link in the description and maybe here on the screen somewhere if I remember to put it up. And lastly, I saw a side of Noam in this interview that I've never seen before. He engaged in small talk, he laughed. I've really never seen this in any of the videos I've seen of him. So I left those bits in. Most of this took place before the interview was meant to begin, but because I really appreciated seeing that side of him, I figured you would too, so decided to leave our little small talk bit at the beginning in this episode. And that's it. Again, this was a great honor to get to speak to Noam. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Noam. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you great. How are you? Very good. <laughs> Sorry for the technical glitch. Was having a hard time getting the invitation. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You know, um, I'm a fair amount younger than you, and I sometimes struggle with technology these days too. So, so first of all, how are you uh, doing through these challenging times? Surviving. Very busy. Staying at home. I don't leave home. I no visitors. We're very isolated. This is a hot spot for the pandemic, Arizona, where I live, and uh, very busy. The endless requests for talks, uh, interviews, statements, uh, endless. Can't deal with a fraction. 
Yeah, well, I, I truly appreciate you giving me the time. And, uh, you know, it's understandable. Uh, we're facing some unprecedented times. A lot of people, I'm, I'm sure, want to know. How, how are you making out? I'm doing well. I'm in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. We're in the midst of uh, what seems to be a second wave, but things are open. People are out. People are wearing masks. Israelis are not so good at social distancing uh, and not so good at following the rules. Um, but all things considered, I, you know, our numbers are still where we have 2,000 new cases a day, um, 2,000 more than we'd like to have. But I think all things considered, I think it's a pretty good place to be right now. That respect. <laughs> so, you know, let, let's, let's start with talking about this global pandemic. Uh, it's something that most most of the world is concerned about. And most experts uh, tell us we will face more pandemics in the future. How do you think we can better prepare for the next pandemic, but in a way that doesn't give government unprecedented control and power over our lives? Well, we know how to prepare for it. In fact, the advice was given in 2003 after the SARS epidemic was contained. Scientists warned right away, there's going to be more, probably worse, and here's how to prepare for it. They're giving exactly the same warnings today, but more severely, because the threat of a new pandemic is even more severe now than it was in 2003. What you have to do is investigate coronaviruses. We know where they are, mostly in China, deep in caves other places to explore them, find out, learn what we can about them, set the stage for developing vaccines quickly and countermeasures quickly, put in place pandemic control measures. Now, all of that can be done. There are barriers, same barriers as in 2003. Three barriers. First one was called capitalism. Who's going to undertake the efforts? Should be the drug companies. Now, they have huge resources, profits coming out of their ears. You know, the so-called trade agreements have given, granted them lavish monopoly pricing rights, huge laboratories, all the facilities. But they can't do it because they're governed by the logic of capitalism, which is you don't waste money on something that might save a catastrophe 10 years from now. You spend your resources on what you can make profit on tomorrow. And besides, why should they spend money on vaccines, which people use once? Why not on drugs, which people use every day? So the entire capitalist logic tells them you're out of it. Okay, so they're out. There's another possibility, the government. Government has endless resources, wonderful laboratories, could pick up the ball and run with it. But there's another problem. It's called neoliberalism. Go back to Ronald Reagan's inauguration address. The gov government is the problem, not the solution. The solution is to hand all decisions over to unaccountable private power. Government has a flaw, it's influenced by people. We don't want that. So government is the problem. So put everything in the hands of private power. Uh, they'll take care of things. Yeah, we've had 40 years to see how they take care of things as if it was any, in any doubt in the first place. Total disaster for most of the population, of course, worldwide. Now that's the same thing. Those who cr created the crisis want to keep it that way and to make sure that it's even harsher than before. In fact, they're doing pretty well from the pandemic. You know, take a look at the US economy. Stock market is breaking records. Poverty and unemployment are breaking records. They're dissociated. Uh, the people who run the society and the economy are doing fine. Now, Treasury's pouring out funds. Most of them go to them, keeps the stock market high. Uh, who cares if the economy collapses and is wrecked? That's what we want. 
we're going to make sure that that remains. So that's two problems. Capitalism, neoliberalism. There's a third problem, malevolence of leaders, not everywhere. So for example, when President Obama took office in January 2009, first action was to call a meeting of the Presidential Science Advisory Council, ask them to develop a pandemic response program, which they did and which he implemented. It stayed in place. Uh, American scientists were working with Chinese scientists, Chinese colleagues, to identify coronaviruses deep in caves, dangerous work, to study them, to find out what the threats are. Uh, it wasn't perfect. They didn't undertake the moves that should have been taken, but were blocked by the neoliberal framework and capitalist logic. But they did something. So the US was more or less prepared. Then came January 2017. Donald Trump came into office. First days in office, dismantled the pandemic response program totally. Started canceling the programs in which American scientists worked in China. Started defunding the Center for Disease Control. Defunding something he continued to do every year of his presidency. Even in February 2020, with the pandemic raging, new budget, defund the Center for Disease Control and all other health-related parts of government. They don't contribute to profit for, the, for the, his masters, the sectors of the corporate sector that he works for. They just save the population, so dismantle them. Now, then came a series of outrageous actions I won't, there's no time to run through them, but just to illustrate. Last March, the United States was comparable to Europe in number of cases and number of deaths. If you look at the curve since then, Europe has gone way down, even Italy, which had a pandemic, way down. The US, the curve has risen. It's worse than it was before. That's due to malevolent malevolence in the White House. Uh, okay, so that's the third problem. Capitalist logic, the neoliberal assault on the world, and malevolent uh, individuals of whom you have one right where you are. It seems like in, in addition to that, there America faces a challenge because such a large portion of the population doesn't even believe Corona is real. They, they view it as a hoax. And it seems like this is an ongoing theme with some group of population in the United States. Uh, it's the same group who thinks uh, climate change is a hoax and vaccines are a hoax. And, you know, if, if you get to the bottom of why they don't believe in this stuff, they essentially think that the government is manufacturing their consent. And, you know, you've rightfully pointed out uh, for a large part of your career why we shouldn't believe government and mainstream media. So how in a situation like this can people make sense out of what's going on and know which institutions they can or can't trust? Two points. First of all, that's not the part of the population that's denying it. They've never heard of these books. The deniers are the Republican Party. That's a white, male, rural, Christian, conservative. They never heard of any of the things you're talking about. They're the same people who are expecting the second coming of Jesus Christ uh, within maybe within their lifetimes. Uh, they're the evangelical population that strongly supporting Israeli crimes and atrocities out of deeply rooted anti-Semitism. They're the most anti-Semitic group in history. They're hoping for and they're looking forward to the Armageddon in which uh, everyone is destroyed, uh, the saved rise to heaven, everyone else goes to eternal perdition including all the Jews, 
except for 100,000 or so who found Christ in time. Nothing more anti-Semitic than that in history. Even Hitler didn't go that far. They're the strongest supporters of Israel because they want Israeli crimes to lead to a conflict which will bring Armageddon and Christ returning and all of these things. That's a large part very large part of the Trump coalition, the ones who are denying all these things. Uh, the others are white supremacists, uh, conservative rural Americans who don't like the fact that their world is being taken away by urban uh, populations which are diverse uh, uh, minority groups and so on. That's uh, straight racism. Understandable racism, but racism. Okay. It's not manufacturing consent. But they're the ones who are hearing from, they get their news, not from you and me. They get it from Rush Limbaugh, people like that. Uh, Trump's favorite radio announcer, the biggest one in the country, audience of tens of millions of people. What do they hear from him? They hear from him that there are four corners of deceit academia, government, media, and science. They thrive on deceit. That's the message. It's reinforced by Trump, radically anti-science, uh, uh, anti-media uh, administration. They hear it on Fox News, which is an echo chamber for Trump. Uh, and that's all they hear. So it has nothing to do with manufacturing consent. And incidentally, the message of manufacturing consent was not to not believe the media. It, the message was the media are the best source of news and information, but you have to understand how they are filtering, shaping, and distorting what they present. If you understand that, you can compensate for it. But if you want to understand what's going on in the world, read the New York Times. It's the best source. Distorted leaves out things, you can compensate for that. In fact, a large part of the book, if anybody bothered to read it, was defense of the media against attacks from, organ this happened to be Freedom House, which claimed that the media were so adversarial that they lost the war in Vietnam. They were unpatriotic. What we showed is that that's, the, the attacks are total lies they reported accurately and courageously, but within a framework of extreme state propaganda, saying it's a mistake. We're making mistakes. We should do it better. Like uh, uh, the uh, Russian propaganda during uh, line during Afghanistan. It's not that it's a crime to invade another country. It's a mistake. We have to do it better. So they reported accurately, courageously, reporters are honest, courageous people, but within a framework of subordination to state propaganda, okay? That's what you have to understand. So yes, these are, but this has nothing to do with the denialism that you're talking about here. It's coming from a different part of the population. Yeah. It's very serious. J just to clarify, you know, I. I imagine that most of the people that are denying this have never heard of the concept of manufacturing um, consent. But in, in speaking to them, you know the claim they're mostly uneducated, right? But but the claim, high school education. The, the claims that they're making is that the government and the media is trying to manipulate us with climate change. So so uh, again, they have a distrust in institutions. The question is, it, it seems like we have an information processing issue because we have there's access to so much information but so much disinformation and for the average individual to try to understand what's true and not not true either they need to be extremely educated and intelligent or they need to trust some institutions discovering truth is not that difficult it's not quantum physics any ordinary person with common sense and minimal literacy can cut through the propaganda and find out what's happening. It doesn't take brilliance. It can be done. I know plenty of what are called ordinary people with not much education do it very easily. 
okay? That when I was growing up as a child, my extended family were first generation East European Jewish immigrants. Uh, so many of them never even went to school and got past fourth grade. They were very educated. They had no problem understanding what was going on, and partly because they were members of labor unions. Labor means uh, had worker education programs. Furthermore, labor movements just brought people together to, for a common goal, to talk to each other and to think about things together. Uh, they were members of political parties, socialist party, communist party. Could like or not like what they were doing, but at least you were thinking. Okay, when you have an atomized population, one of the great achievements of neoliberalism has been to separate people, to atomize people, to leave them alone. This is conscious. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, when she came into office, first claimed, there is no society, there are only individuals. You're an individual alone in the marketplace. First act, destroy the labor unions, both Reagan and Thatcher. First act, very significant. Labor movement unions, the main way in which people to get together to struggle for their rights. So let's destroy them. Let's put people alone in the marketplace. To you and your TV set or you and your iPhone these days, that's it. That's no society. And Thatcher surely didn't know it, but she was paraphrasing Marx. Uh, Marx in the mid 19th century, when he was condemning the autocratic rulers of Europe, said they're trying to turn society into a sack of potatoes. Isolated people who can't act together with no institutional support, no way to organize themselves. That's neoliberalism. And it's been very substantially successful. That's why you have the kind of people who were, say, my relatives, unemployed working people, first generation immigrants back in the 30s, they're now listening to Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump, and being told that science and government and media and academia are based on deceit. That's what's drilled into their heads. The only organizations they have are evangelical churches where the preachers tell them the same thing, even worse. Uh, society, they have succeeded in the, the unions are practically gone and the ones that exist are under severe attack and other forms of organization have mostly collapsed. So yes, you're alone in the marketplace, you suffer. That's called, liber it's called libertarian in the United States. An amazing use of words. Uh, Anatole France at the right definition of this kind of libertarianism. The rich man and the poor man are both free to live under the bridge at night. That's liberty, okay? That's neoliberalism and it's liberty. Uh, and the world has suffered from it. We see it all over the world, not just in the United States, uh, Europe, for example. A lot of, a huge number of people are angry, uh, resentful, uh, can have contempt for institutions, the old political parties, the center left, center right parties are collapsing. Uh, people are angry, they're right, they have a lot to be angry about. It's fertile terrain for demagogues who can come and say, I'll save you. It's those bad people who are responsible for your plight, not the corporate system, not the political party, not them, they're fine. It's immigrants. It's uh, black people, it's the poor. Uh, they're the ones who are responsible for your plight. That's, and it can work. We've seen it work in the past many times. Uh, Donald Trump is a master of it. You take a look at the Republican National Convention that just took place. Very interesting spectacle. Not one word about policy, nothing. Just engender fear of the radicals who are trying to destroy society, of the immigrants who are coming here to take your jobs, of the poor who are uh, stealing your money because they're on welfare. Uh, just fear. 
They're taking away your country, your nice white Christian religious country. They're taking it away from you. We got to fight back with one. This is the perfect autocrat. He's a genius at it. With one hand, you hold up a slogan that says, I love you. I'm working for you. The other hand, you stab him in the back. That's Trump's policies. Working very well, not for the first time. We see similar things elsewhere. You have your own version of it in Israel, uh, other versions elsewhere, Bolsonaro in Brazil, others, Orban in Hungary. In fact, one of the interesting things that's developing now and is not being sufficiently discussed is the one geostrategic program that's coming out of the Trump administration. The chaos of the Trump administration is so extraordinary, it's hard to find anything coherent. But there is one thing, that to create a reactionary international of the most reactionary states in the world, run from the White House, includes Bolsonaro's Brazil, uh, the Gulf dictators, the family dictatorships of the Gulf, uh, Al Sisi's Egypt, the worst dictatorship in Egypt's history, Israel, which has moved so far to the right that it fits very naturally into this nexus, uh, Modi's India, trying to destroy Indian secular democracy, and crush Muslim rights, crush Kashmiri rights, uh, Orban in Hungary, uh, and Salvini in Italy, people like that try to create a reactionary international like that. It's a major development. There is a counter development. In two weeks, the, there's going to be the first session of the Progressive International, which is trying to develop a counter to this. It's based on the Sanders movement in the United States, uh, uh, DM25, the transnational European movement initiated by Yanis Varoufakis that's trying to save what's useful in the European Union and overcome the deep flaws, avoid a lot of participation in the Global South. Uh, it's meeting in Iceland, where the Prime Minister is a member of the international. If this can develop and flourish, could be a counter to the reactionary international based in the White House. That's a major battle taking shape. It's class war on an international scale. So I was actually not aware of that counter movement you just described. I have been seeing certain counter movements, um, one of them led by Bernie Sanders, but it seems like there's aspects of this counter movement that are maybe a bit concerning. It, it's, uh, it takes the form of a radical social justice movement um, that is intersectional, but very selective in their intersectionality. So, you know, it'd be um, black Americans, the LGBTQ plus community, w women, but it seems that uh, the w working white men, not only are they not part of this coalition, they're viewed as the enemy. And it almost seems like this is counterproductive because instead of building a broad alliance across the aisle, it seems like this selective form of intersectionality is really getting in the way of building the coalition needed to combat neoliberalism and the radicalization we're seeing on the other side. It's true. The working class has not been an active participant. That's transitory. That can change. You take a look at recent years. Uh, Trump, according to legend, won the white working class. That's not what happened. You take a look at the voting. The Democrats lost the white working class. It's not that Trump won them. You know, they had nowhere else to turn. In fact, most of them, many of the Trump voters had voted for Obama. He betrayed them. Okay? When Obama came in, uh, the white working class voted for him. They believed the promises, the nice words about hope and change and all the pleasant rhetoric. What happened? Well, what happened was very quick. This was, he came in on the recession, okay? The financial collapse after the housing market collapse. Congress passed legislation to 
deal with the financial collapse. It had two parts. One part was to bail out the banks who had caused the recession with their cr criminal predatory lending processes, consciously caused the recession. So we have to bail them out because we can't let them collapse despite the crimes. That was one part. The other part of the legislation was support the people who lost their homes, the victims of the recession, the people who lost their homes for foreclosures, support them, let them get their homes back, let them get their lives back. That was the second part of the legislation. That's which part Obama implemented. Okay. You didn't have to read the newspapers to find that out. You saw it in your life. By 2010, two years after Obama was elected, the white working class had turned against him. You saw it in liberal Massachusetts, most liberal state in the country where I was living. There was an election, by election. Uh, Ted Kennedy had died, called the liberal lion, the leading liberal in Congress. He died. There had to be an election to replace him. There was a Democratic liberal running against a conservative Republican who no one had ever heard of before, uh, Scott Brown. He won. Union voters didn't vote for the Democrats. Okay, He won from the affluent suburbs who vote Republican. The urban uh, Democratic voters barely didn't care. Obama had already betrayed them. And it went on with that. Trump comes along in 2016. They abandoned the Democratic Party, uh, which offered nothing to them. Uh, some of them voted for Trump on other grounds. The white nationalist, uh, you know, racist, uh, religious, whatever it might be. But, not, but, but, but it's more the Democrats lost them. And uh, they could come back. They have the same interests fundamentally as the protesters in the street, the Black Lives Matters protesters, and a union can be formed among them. It's not going to happen like that. It's going to take real work after the betrayal of the Democratic Party, which incidentally is still going on. Uh, take a look at what has just happened in the last few weeks. The most important issue that we face is destruction of the climate. Biden and Harris, his vice presidential candidate, each of them had pretty progressive programs on the climate, not because they wanted them, but because they were forced to accept them by the Sanders base, which was working hard to make sure that they had, both by activism in the streets and by working with them directly, to make sure that they had a decent climate program. By no means perfect, but the best that's yet been seen. That was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, if you clicked on the in the internet, you looked up Democratic Party climate program, that's what you saw. Click on that same thing today, it's gone. What you see is something about how to donate to the Democratic Party. Well, we don't know the details of what happened, but you can guess. The Clintonite, donor-oriented uh, Democratic who, gang who run the Democratic National Committee apparently wiped it out. Okay, That's the battle inside the Democratic Party, very much like what just happened in England, where the Blairite uh, right-wing uh, parliamentary Labour Party worked overtime to destroy Corbyn. They couldn't, they'd, they preferred to lose the election than to lose the party to the Corbynites who were trying to create a popular based participatory Labour Party. Blairites couldn't tolerate that. As you may have seen, there's a 800 page study that came out uh, detailing how they tried to destroy the Corbyn campaign, even at the risk of losing the election. It's been suppressed by the media but it's there, okay? One of the things they did was the official Jewish, uh, British part of the population 
launched a campaign, a deceitful, lying campaign to accuse the Labour Party of anti-Semitism and Corbyn of anti-Semitism, full of lies, deceit, picked up by the media who ran with it, picked up by the right-wing Labour Party who ran with it. Corbyn's not a fighter. He couldn't fight back. He just sat there and watched it. Uh, what, what they used was the fact that he expressed some sympathy for Palestinian rights, so therefore he's a Nazi, you know, and made up all sorts of stories about the Labour Party. And it had a big impact. One of the reasons they lost. Uh, the uh, they're going to do, they're doing the same with uh, with Biden. They're going to be accusing him of anti-Semitism and uh, racist, and you know, being anti-Israel. And all of this is going to come out. That's the weapon they can use, uh, just like uh, white supremacy. Uh, but these are the battles we have to fight. You know, the there aren't any angels up there. The institutional structures are not progressive. They're concerned with the rights of the very wealthy, the corporate system. And that's what they're dedicated to. There is variation, significant variation. The Trump Republicans are way off the spectrum. And they're going to destroy the world. The Democrats are old fashioned moderate Republicans. Uh, they can be pushed to the left by the progressive base. Okay, that's the world we're living with. Similar things in Europe with, uh, say, the GM25 effort to uh, be a transnational progressive party. Unfortunately, there's not the same thing in Israel where the left has just disappeared. Right. Um, we, we don't have too much time, which is a shame because I have like 30 more questions. Yeah, C can I ask one more uh, quick random question unrelated and then final final thoughts? Um, what what are your views on psychedelics? Psychedelics? Not my world. I'm old fashioned conservative in that respect. Never joined the 1960s. <laughs> in fact, I'm probably the only person you've ever been in contact with who never tried marijuana. Potentially, and I think we found the one area where you're conservative, or one of the only areas. Culturally conservative. <laughs> Culturally, okay. It's it's a topic that I've been interested in. Psychedelics. It has. Uh, it seems to help open people's minds. So I wanted to see if you had any thoughts of how we could holistically work that into uh, activism. But I, I I appreciate your perspective. asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, so. What is one message you'd like to tell the future generation that are soon going to inherit this world? Well, the future generation is facing a choice that has never arisen in human history. This generation, like it or not, has to decide whether organized human society is going to survive. Nothing less than that. Uh, environmental catastrophe, Nuclear war, new pandemics can destroy organized human life within a few decades. It's not far off. There are ways to handle every one of these problems. They're very easily within reach, very easily, at a fraction of the kind of dedication that was used, say, to fight the Second World War, small fraction. Can be done. It's not going to happen by itself. This generation has to decide whether we're going to survive or not. That's the message that has to be kept in mind. They can do it, they can abandon it, but it's in their hands.